Welcome all to today's webinar. The title is The War in Gaza. Where are we? Why are we here? And where in God's name could we be going? A conversation with Alice Rothschild and Jonathan Kutab. Oh, so uh, this webinar, this, uh, this conversation, it's hosted by the Bishop's Committee for Justice and Peace in the Holy Land. It's a committee of the Episcopal Diocese of Olympia. Uh, it's uh, been a very active committee. Uh, uh, really has done a lot of great things in the Pacific Northwest uh, for the sake of justice. And actually their website, uh, holylandjustice.org. It's a great site with a lot of great information on it. Um, I am Jesse with uh, Friends of Seville North America. And we are also hosting this, and uh, we're very happy that you could be here. Um, you know, we're a Christian voice for Palestine. Please feel to check us out at www.pazna.org. Um, some housekeeping. The session is being recorded. Plan accordingly. If you don't want your name uh, or, your, or your face to show up in any of the recording, uh, change your, you know, you can rename yourself and keep your camera off um, if, if that's a concern. We will have a time for question and answer uh, towards the end, and we're going to be utilizing the chat function for that. Uh, so you'll write any questions you have in the chat function, and then our host, uh, Doug, will be fielding them um, to our speakers. And we do ask uh, in our questions, in our in the chat at all times, you know, just you can't go wrong with the golden rule. Uh, just in every single thing, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. It's good for Zoom chats and it's good for international politics in my view. So at this point, I'm going to invite Doug Thorpe, our moderator to, um, to begin. Uh, greetings to all. Um, thank you, Jesse. And um, I'm coming to you from Seattle, Washington, traditional land of the Duwamish people. And as Jesse said, uh, as a member of uh, the Episcopal uh, Diocese of Olympia here in Washington State, uh, I'm going to introduce Alice and Jonathan, and then we'll begin um, with a conversation with Alice. So Alice is an author, filmmaker, and physician focused on human rights and social justice. Her most recent book, Finding Melody Sullivan, is a young adult novel exploring grief and friendship in the setting of broader political questions raised by the realities in Israel-Palestine. She also has a middle grade novel, old enough to know about a nine-year-old Palestinian American boy and his grandmother from the Aida refugee camp that will be published actually next month. You can find her at www.alicerothschildbooks.com. She writes and lectures widely. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her work, especially in Gaza. She has directed a documentary film called Voices Across the Divide, is a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace Health Advisory Council. She is mentor liaison for We Are Not Numbers, a program for young Gaza writers and is on the board of the Gaza Mental Health Foundation. She was last in Israel, the West Bank and Gaza in August, 2023. So Alice, um, I heard an update this morning on the electronic intifada um, from Tarek Lubani about uh, health situations. Um, um, would love to hear your update and what you are learning uh, about the situation um, there in Gaza. Thanks, Alice. Well, thank you. I'm just going to take a minute to share my screen. Okay. Is that working for you? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me make it. Uh... Oops. Okay. Here we go. And let me move my face over. So I'm gonna, whoops, sorry. I'm sorry, let me just 
Um, okay, I'm just trying to move this away. Okay, great. Um, so what's happening is that the people entering the waiting room are in the middle of my screen. Oh, well. Um, so I'm going to give a health update on what's going on in Gaza. This is uh, day 55, I think. And I'm going to start out with a quote from Avi Dichter, who's the Israel's Minister for Agriculture and former head of the Shin Bet. And what he said is, we are now actually rolling out the Gaza Nakba. And it's estimated that one in 57 Gazans have been killed or injured. So just for a little background, I have been in Gaza four times, each time with a different uh, a humanitarian group invited by the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. So over the years, I've been able to do direct services, women's empowerment, and lots of documentation. And I'm also involved with a number of groups that are focused on Gaza. So um, I'm just gonna read this slide because it's the actual take home message. Um, more than 75 years of Israeli domination and dispossession has affected Palestinian life through occupation, siege and annexation, development and um, de-development and permanent displacement of refugees, severely impacting the ability of Palestinians to access the essential building blocks of health. The fragmentation of society and destruction of the ability and opportunity to create essential institutions involved in healthcare has created a reality that is recognized today as medical apartheid. Two separate systems, two separate realities. You see this impact on uh, the, with disparities in life expectancy, estimated to be 73.9 for Palestinians, is probably lower now, 82 and a half years for Israelis, and an infant mortality, 17.9 per thousand live births in the territories and 2.9 per thousand in Israel. Medical apartheid comes about through the de-development, the active de-development of the healthcare system through a strict medical permitting system. So if a person in the territories wants to have higher level care, they need to apply for a medical permit to go to East Jerusalem or to Israel or Jordan. Uh, there's a chronic lack of medications and equipment, multiple direct attacks, and a high level of conflict-related trauma. Now, whenever we uh, discuss healthcare in this region, I think we have to have it framed by the Geneva Conventions, which basically states that an occupying power must not interfere with the ability of healthcare personnel to perform the humanitarian functions. So when I'm describing what's going on, I want you to be thinking about the Geneva Conventions. So healthcare in Gaza has been uh, described as fragmented and incoherent. There are uh, 2.3 million people. The Ministry of Health was established in 1994 after Oslo to set up a healthcare system. There's also the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, otherwise known as UNRWA, which was set up in about 1950 for the care of refugees. So there are about one and a half million Gazan refugees living in eight very, very crowded, poor refugee camps. Then there's a host of non-governmental organizations, such as the Palestinian Medical Relief Society, and then there are private providers. On top of all of this, we have the role of the Israeli government in what is called de-development. So if we look at what the system was like uh, before the current aggression, there were 13 governmental hospitals, 142 primary healthcare centers. Um, the Ministry of Health uh, creates some of those, UNRWA creates some, and the NGOs create the majority of them. There were also approximately 40 private hospitals, two medical schools, and then a bunch of professional schools. But there's a real disconnect between uh, the people that are able to provide services and the jobs available to pay them to do this. So for instance, there are 120 nursing positions open each year, yet there are 5,000 nursing students in Gaza. And there are less than 20 psychiatrists in Gaza and less than seven are doctors. Now we know that long before all of this was going on, the UN uh, made this assessment that Gaza would not be habitable by 2020. So before the war started, we already had a desperate humanitarian catastrophe, a siege, water that was polluted and salinated, and then healthcare, nutrition, fuel, electricity, sewage management, housing, all already on life supports. There is a lot of environmental contamination from all the bombing, 
there's a climate crisis. Gaza is a coastal plain. Um, there was the impact of the COVID-19 epidemic, which pandemic, which isn't over yet, which took a big hit on the healthcare system. And also the Great March of Return, which was a weekly march for a year to uh, the perimeter fence. And the Israeli snipers had a policy of shooting at the legs of the marchers. So there was a massive amount of orthopedic injuries. Now we know that there are some big health issues that existed before 2023. Um, there's a real shortage of electricity. Not only is it four to eight hours a day, it's at various times during the 24 hours, often unpredictable. There were fuel shortages and hospitals clothing, closing. There was this restrictions on permits to leave, as I mentioned, and severe medical and equipment shortages. There were also a lack of specialists because people can't leave to train outside and the medical personnel were exhausted and frequently unpaid. Then on top of that, we had the crisis in UNRWA funding. It was pretty much slashed by Trump, partially restored by Biden. But even before the war, UNRWA was sending out these messages saying that they were going to have to cease operations due to the budget crisis and donor fatigue. Now, the Israeli siege um, involves massive amounts of control of everything that goes in and out of the Strip, but they also do other things to make Palestinians miserable. They have a, a um, practice of fumigating farmlands along the eastern border or eastern fence with herbicides to destroy the crops. They've decimated the fishing industry um, by severely limiting the fishing zone and also by repeatedly attacking the fisher folk and their boats and making it relatively impossible to have a livelihood. They also do this thing where they have these wells along the eastern uh, fence and um, right before harvesting, they intentionally flood the crops, making them ruined. Now, I was there in August, and at that point, there were around 18,000 Palestinians from Gaza working in Israel, mostly in agriculture and um, construction, and they had no health care. So when they were injured in these high-risk uh, jobs, uh, the employers didn't uh, provide them with health care, and they were basically dumped back into Gaza, where it was often impossible to get adequate care. When I was there, I saw child beggars on the street. I heard reports of men selling their kidneys to pay to feed their families and families who could no longer afford olive oil. In August, uh, the UN Right to Health program uh, uh, studied the exit permits and found it was 88% below the monthly average in 2000. Most of it was for work-related purposes and only 6% of the exits were for patients referred for medical treatment outside of Gaza Strip. And 19% of the uh, permits were not approved on time. So you take the highest risk people, you make them go through a whole shenanigans to get the permit, they wait, and then the permit is not approved and they miss their appointments. Now, by the time uh, the uh, ceasefire started in November 24th, uh, we had seen the utter disintegration of the healthcare system. And as of now, as far as I can tell, and I keep having to update the numbers every day, um, about 15,000 people have been killed, 68% women and children, and 30, more than 35,000 injured. Uh, there are about 6,000 uh, missing people under the rubble, including children. And colleagues that I hear from talk about rotting corpses in the street, the smell of death everywhere. It's just pretty horrific. There's also a massive um, attack going on in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem that often gets lost in this. And uh, 258 people have been killed uh, since the um, uh, attack by Hamas, 55 children, and then almost 3,000 injured. In Israel, uh, the total that were killed in the Hamas attack was 1,200, including almost 5,000 injured. And uh, to date, 75 Israeli soldiers have been killed in Gaza. And there are some 240 hostages in Gaza. And as we know, they're starting to be released. So for the last uh, seven weeks, there have been relentless, relentless Israeli airstrikes hitting multiple different kinds of civilian structures, as well as hospitals, clinics, ambulances. There's been a full electricity blackout, uh, no uh, fuel coming in, and uh, no water or food. Uh, the current estimate is that 60% of all the housing units have been destroyed or damaged. 80% of the population is internally displaced, IDPs, uh, many sheltering in UNRWA designated shelters. There are severe shortages of water, food, and medicine. And not surprisingly, there are increasing intra-communal tensions and increasing gender-based violence. 
It's estimated that there are about 50,000 pregnant women with about 5,500 deliveries each month. These women are not having any prenatal care. And when they go into labor, they don't even know where they can get uh, cared for. And many are delivering at home in the rubble and tents in really horrific, dangerous situations. Now, Gazans have been repeatedly taught, told that they had to move south. At the beginning, they could take their vehicles, but that ended quickly, and so they had to walk. And many have reported being shot in the legs, being arrested, beaten, stripped, reminding us once again that there are no safe places in Gaza. And indeed, 40% uh, of the deaths happened in the south. And this uh, um, attack on people walking south has happened even after the ceasefire. And as you can imagine, uh, any patient who relies on electricity, we're talking the NICU, the ICU, kidney dialysis, cancer patients, those patients are dying. Uh, we have is Israeli attacks on healthcare as well. Um, probably 200 personnel at this point have been killed. Ambulances have been destroyed. And it's estimated that two thirds of the hospitals and many of the centers can't function because of direct attacks and lack of fuel. There are critical, critical shortages of drugs, blood products, and supplies. There have been no medical permits to the West Bank or Israel. And clinicians are reporting uh, unusual burns on the wounded and the dead, suggestive of uh, the use of white phosphorus bombs, which is illegal. And as I mentioned, water is an issue. Uh, the groundwater production is less than 5%. Uh, sewage pumping and water treatment, wastewater treatment, uh, totally shut down uh, until the ceasefire. And there was reports of sewage flooding in the streets, particularly in Rafah. And as you can imagine with these horrific unhygienic situation, chickenpox, scabies, lice, respiratory illnesses, diarrhea, and hepatitis are increasing significantly. Over half the education facilities have been destroyed, including UNRWA schools, which are used for emergency shelters. So the UNRWA has reported that 112 UN staff have been killed. And throughout all of the bombing, they kept saying they're gonna stop operations because they can't do it anymore. And as I mentioned, uh, the smell of death, there were unidentified bodies and rotting corpses at Shifa Hospital. They finally dug a mass grave. And there was also a mass grave in Rafah. Through all of the bombing, uh, Palestinian armed groups continued indiscriminate rocket fire into Israel until the ceasefire. It is estimated that the Israeli bombardment was equivalent to two atomic bombs uh, that rained down on an area six miles by 26 miles in size. So we have massive, massive civilian deaths, uh, what um, many of us, including myself, believe is a genocide and multiple war crimes. Now, I want to just focus on Al-Shifa Hospital because, as you know, hospitals are supposed to be safe places, and I think this is a pretty egregious example. Um, Al-Shifa was the main hospital uh, in Gaza City um, and in Gaza Strip, uh, 700 beds uh, serving about a half a million people um, on a huge uh, area with multiple buildings and 1,500 medical staff, including 500 doctors and 760 nurses. So before the Israeli invasion into the hospital, the hospital had already been bombed and the bombs had hit a surgery departments, coronary care division, a warehouse, maternity floor, and the outpatient clinic. Then on November 15th, Israeli troops and tanks moved into the hospital. They took control of several sections. They searched and interrogated people. They went into the nephrology and internal medicine departments and stormed them, and they detonated a medicine storehouse. Uh, Israeli troops ordered all young men on the hospital grounds to surrender. They took captive uh, uh, dozens of displaced people, relatives of patients, and even the injured inside the hospital. Many Palestinian men were interrogated. It's reported some were being held naked and blindfolded and taken to unknown locations. Israel has accused Hamas of placing a command center below Al-Shifa Hospital, but Hamas and the hospital officials have denied this claim. Now, the New York Times was able to get into the hospital and into this uh, tunnel that the Israelis had found. And they reported uh, that there were Israeli soldiers that demonstrated that there were a couple of guns, some grenades, protective vests, a military uniform within an MRI unit, which seemed an unlikely place to put anything metal. Uh, but they also claimed that they were unable to assess who put them there. And they did not, you know, they couldn't say if there was a command center or not because they didn't see anything. It's also interesting that when the troops moved in, there were no reports of clashes with Hamas gunmen, and it appeared more like a violent police raid. 
Um, as you can imagine, uh, patients in the ICU and the NICU died uh, because of lack of supplies, oxygen, and water. I'm sure many of you have seen this picture of the babies in the NICU when the um, incubators could no longer work. They put them all together, hoping that their body heat and blankets would keep them warm enough to survive. So just to give you a sense of this, there were more than 7,000 people, including patients, sheltering inside the hospital. People think hospitals are safe places. A doctor was told uh, at 9 a.m. that they had received an order from the Israelis to leave in one hour. This was obviously impossible to evacuate 7,000 people, and there were no ambulances, no fuel for ambulances, no way to transport them out. So the situation caused, quote, a great state of panic and fear. Uh, many people left on foot. There are pictures of people pushing gurneys and uh, wheelchairs. And the people who were unable to leave uh, stayed behind with a handful of medical staff. And as one medical staff said, the situation is really dire. The facility was largely deserted. Now, I just want you to know that there was an um, interview on CNN, if anyone missed this, where Ehud Barak, the former prime minister, said that Israeli engineers had built the tunnels under Al Shifa Hospital in the 1980s to increase hospital capacity in a high risk area. And then he went on to say, you know, this happens with lots of hospitals. Israeli hospitals have tunnels under them. You know, it was just a stunning uh, little moment in uh, this whole saga. So um, at this point, um, with the ceasefire, uh, concerns are being raised about vulnerable, gr vulnerable groups. And because you must imagine, people are still living in these horrendous shelter conditions. So we're looking at people with disabilities, women who are pregnant, postpartum, or breastfeeding, women, who, uh, people who are recovering from injuries or surgeries and had to leave the hospital, and people with compromised immune systems. I also want you to think about the level of emotional trauma in the entire population. This is 2.3 million people with traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, panic. It's just horrific to think about the level of emotional trauma. Uh, now, what we do know is that the uh, stocks of essential food commodities had gone to zero. You know, no fishing was allowed, so they weren't able to fish. And now that the Rafah crossing is uh, open, there is some trucks coming in with food and water and medical supplies. Um, after several days, the Israelis finally allowed fuel for the hospitals and clinics, water wells, desalination plants, west, west, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, but at the beginning, they wouldn't let anything go to the north. Uh, humanitarian groups reported collecting 400 tons of solid waste, which was just in the streets. Uh, WASH, which refers to water, sanitation, and hygiene evaluations, have begun with different organizations to figure out what needs to be fixed, which is basically everything. Primary health centers began to open, and uh, the Gaza Community Mental Health Program began to open its centers as well. Now, with this uh, temporary ceasefire, there have been no new fatalities. The numbers are probably a little bigger today, but 81 hostages were released in exchange for 180 Palestinian prisoners. We know that at this point, there are 1 million children facing uh, food insecurity. And uh, if this does not get dealt with, they will have malnourishment and ultimately starvation. And this applies also to pregnant women, which is a critical time not to be malnourished. That means that every pregnancy in Gaza is high risk. There's also a tremendous need for hygiene products for menstruating women who've had basically nothing. And there is an increase in gender-based violence, as I mentioned. There are hundreds of trucks bringing in aid. One of the most egregious things that happened was that the Israeli military arrested Dr. Mohammed Abu Salmiya, who's the director of Al Shifa Hospital, along with several other medical staff, and he's in some administrative detention somewhere. And there is no electricity and no water in the north. Um, I just learned that there is one bakery that's functioning, uh, but uh, farmers have not been able to harvest their crops so that the crops that would normally be in the markets are not there. Uh, the livestock also are starving, and uh, farmers have started slaughtering them for food. And then there is extensive contamination with mines. And so that's a whole nother problem that the Gazans are facing. Um, the other challenges that they have, besides the shortages of fuel, medical supplies, water, food, and essential supplies, is that the humanitarian partners have been largely displaced. So the first step they have to do is just try to figure out where is their staff? Where are the families? Who survived? I mean, the whole thing is in disarray. The other big challenge is the tremendous amount of overcrowding of um, internally displaced people. I've read numbers of like 500 people using one toilet kind of overcrowding. And also NGO partners are experiencing difficulties with their logistics capacity in Egypt. 
and only 19% of funding required to respond to this crisis has been committed. And I want you to look at the picture of the Rafa crossing here. You can see it's a tiny little crossing not designed for massive humanitarian aid. So when I put it all together, what I would summarize is that a Hamas war crime does not justify an Israeli genocide. That what we are seeing here is an immense amount of racism and revenge, violations of international law, collective punishment, multi-generational trauma, and what seems to me obvious ethnic cleansing and genocide. What is also quite clear from all of this is that the health of Palestinians is intrinsically linked to their liberation and to the end of the siege. But the first immediate thing that we all need to be working for is a ceasefire, followed by massive humanitarian aid. Israel does not believe in you break it, you fix it. They think everybody else is going to fix it and release of hostages. Then it is absolutely necessary that the root causes be addressed and Israel and the US, its main funder, be held accountable. So I'm just gonna close with this poem by Ahmed Dremli. He is a writer uh, from We Are Not Numbers. This is a group that I work with. We mentor uh, young writers um, to have their pieces, their voices heard and get published on the website. And um, Ahmed uh, has uh, lived through the bombing. We've lost uh, four of our writers at this point that I know of, but the Israelis killed his best friend, nine of his cousins and uncle and other friends and family members who are still under the rubble. And what's happened is that the writers have been not able to actually write, uh, partly because they're totally freaked out and also because uh, they have no electricity, internet, all that kinds of things. So what some of the mentors have been doing is taking the texts that they've received from the writers and putting them together into stories and poems. So this is a poem created by his text messages. I'm still breathing, but that is not enough to feel alive. I lost my loved ones. I lost my power, hope, dreams, and my last tears. Nothing can express the pain of losing the people who were a main part of my life. Nothing can erase the last look at them from my eyes. Nothing can stop replaying our memories before Israel took them away. And nothing can let me imagine moving forward with my life after them. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And I can only underscore um, the work that We Are Not Numbers is doing and encourage everybody to um, look them up on the web and um, donate. I've been working with a young woman um, in Gaza through We Are Not Numbers, and I know how powerful it has been uh, for her knowing that her voice is um, getting out really to the world. So, and again, extraordinary um, and, and horrifying, Alice, um, all that you've shared. Um, Jonathan, um, uh, most of you on this call will be familiar with Jonathan. He uh, currently serves as the Executive Director of Friends of Sabeel North America, FASNA. He is also the co-founder of the Palestinian human rights group Al-Haq, co-founder of Nonviolence International. Well-known international human rights attorney, Jonathan practices in the U.S., Palestine, and Israel. He serves on the board of Bethlehem Bible College, president of the board of Holy Land Trust. Jonathan was the head of the legal committee negotiating the Cairo Agreement of 1994 between Israel and the PLO. After graduating with his doctor of jurisprudence, the JD from Virginia Law School, practicing for a couple of years on Wall Street, Jonathan returned home to Palestine. He was visiting scholar at Osgood Law School at York, York University in Toronto in the fall of 2017, founding member of Just Peace Advocates Movement for One Peace Justice, a Canadian-based international law human rights not-for-profit organization. He's a resident of East Jerusalem and Pennsylvania, partner of Kitab Khoury and Hannah Law Firm in East Jerusalem. So Jonathan, you've seen decades um, of uh, this work. You've seen decades of uh, bombings in Gaza um, and are certainly, um, I'm, sh I'm sure, uh, in touch with people both in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, why don't you start just by telling us what you're hearing 
um, both from people you know in Gaza and then in the West Bank, and um, what your thoughts are about where we are now and where we might be going. Thank you, Doug. Uh, after that recitation by Alice, I just feel like taking a few minutes to pause and to take some of it in because it yeah. is a lot to take in. Yes. Even before October 7, Gaza was in such a miserable situation uh, in, in, in Israel, they, they don't tell uh, somebody go to hell. Uh, they say, go to Gaza. That's the Hebrew expression for saying, go to hell. So, my first, my first comment is that this is the first time that we have observed a genocide taking place before our eyes in real time on television every night. Uh, people talking about the Holocaust in Germany uh, say uh, most people didn't know or pretended they didn't know. And many Germans said we didn't know this was happening. Here we all know we see it happening, it's happening before our eyes, and we are allowing it to happen. The second point that I wanted to make is the direct complicity of the United States in this genocide. Not only by granting massive amounts of military uh, supplies and new bombs and additional ammunition as they were running out of the ammunition they were dropping so massively and so quickly. But more importantly, by providing a diplomatic umbrella that prevented the international community, the Security Council, and anybody else from putting an end to this ongoing uh, massacre, the war crimes, and the genocide. Not only that, but the United States government has specifically endorsed many of the talking points and justifications that the Israelis have used and where those justifications were lacking in legitimacy or credibility have lent their own credibility at the highest level. From the president himself who said he saw pictures of 40 beheaded babies uh, and who said that he had internal information about Al Shifa hospital being used as a uh, uh, command center for Hamas, to endorsing the goal of terminating, eradicating, completely destroying Hamas as the legitimate uh, objective uh, by the Israelis, which justified everything else that flowed from it, including the not only the massive bombing, the cutting off of water, electricity, food, but also the forced movement from the uh, north to the south, as well as the attacks on uh, medical facilities, churches, mosques, schools, and other institutions as being somehow legitimate uh, actions in pursuit of this objective of eliminating Hamas. So the United States is complicit, is part of this. In fact, it is so clear uh, that, that, that what its role is, that anybody who heard Secretary Blinken today, just a few hours ago, telling the Israelis what are the perimeters of what is going to be allowed from now on, 
namely you cannot do in the south what you did in the north. You have to follow the following rules and regulations. Uh, we will know that it is the United States who has been enabling and permitting this genocide to take place. A third point that I want to make is the strange complicity of the corporate media in this country. How quickly they bought the Israeli narrative to the point of presenting a narrative as consistent as anything in any totalitarian country, where the government's official position is repeated and endorsed by media institutions, by colleges and universities, by newspapers and magazines from the left to the right, all of them endorsing the same narrative of Hamas being evil that needed to be eradicated and that uh, anything that happens, including massive uh, casualties among civilians are legitimate collateral damage, uh, that they are actually the fault of Hamas for quote, using the civilian population and institutions as human shields. Without offering any evidence of this, we are supposed to accept it. And I am shocked that in, in, in a country supposedly with free speech, that this would be so totally uniformly accepted to the point where anybody who even calls for a ceasefire are themselves labeled uh, terrorist sympathizers, are themselves under threat to their uh, business, to their positions, to their uh, reputation, uh, and maybe to their employment also, uh, particularly among uh, academics. The third and final point that I wanted to make before we can engage in a uh, discussion of these matters is the level to which ordinary people who are willing to challenge this narrative, who are willing to see human Palestinians as human beings, who are willing to see the suffering, the destruction, the utter collapse, deliberate, uh, deliberately brought about of an entire society, its livelihood, its economy, its health services, never mind its schools, the absence of any kind of minimal services or protection, the degree to which that has shocked the conscience of ordinary people, we see that these ordinary people willing to challenge the narrative can in fact impact the situation, can in fact have an influence, did in fact lead to the current pause and probably will cause a reduction, if not a stop, to the ongoing uh, genocide. I am personally convinced that one of the goals of Israel, uh, when it ordered 1.2 million people to move south and then started to systematically destroy their homes behind them, was also to keep pushing them out into Egypt. And I think that only the popular public opinion of people, like many who are listening to this event today, your actions, your refusal to accept to be part of this ongoing genocide is probably the only thing that is preventing such a massive displacement 
into Egypt and who knows, maybe also into Jordan from the West Bank. The, the, the magnitude, the level of destruction, of suffering, the, the numbers are horrendous to even contemplate. The total absence of any way out, any defense, any safe place, any protection. When you are dealing with one of the most powerful armies in the world, which openly says we are removing any restraints. We want destruction, not accuracy, in pursuing our goals. We are treating our opponents as Amalek, as the tribe in the Old Testament, which was ordered to be annihilated. The commandment of genocide, which Netanyahu has actually quoted, even though he's not a religious person. Uh, the, 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 the God commanded us to totally destroy to remember what Amalek did, and we remember, and we will act accordingly. To, to totally dehumanize uh, the Palestinians in Gaza and to treat them as human animals openly, and to say, this is how we are treating them. Uh, this level of honesty and openness about the desire for vengeance and destruction and elimination and eradication, uh, I, I have never heard before, uh, not in Israel and not in any other uh, similar situation, that it would actually take place openly and frankly uh, before our sight, I think is one of the most shocking things about the events that's, that are taking place in Gaza today. These are just a few of my initial comments, and, and we can begin a discussion, uh, I think, about it uh, from here on out. Doug? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and, and just to echo uh, something that I think you were, you were at least hinting at, um, um, at least my sense is that um, there, there are some uh, some members of the media, um, certainly in the states, that are at least educating people, not just about what's going on currently, but about you know really the historical context. So, um, my sense, at least, is that um, more people are becoming aware of of the situation. Um, than have than it's been true in the past. Is that your sense? And that would be a question for Alice as well. That there is the word is getting out more broadly in terms of what's going on, also in the West Bank, just historically. Well, I, I can say that the, the the level of the lie has been so huge. Mm -hmm. uh, that that I think it can only be maintained for a short time. Mm -hmm. uh, even with uh, the United States president and the establishment trying to lend it credibility, trying to pretend that what is happening is in fact limited, that Israel is doing everything it can to limit civilian losses. Yes. I mean, people can see it with their own eyes. Yeah. They can see a level of destruction uh, that's unheard of before uh, in, 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 in certainly in modern history. Uh, when you think that more, uh, more people have been killed, more children have been killed here than uh, yeah. certainly than in the Ukraine uh, and Afghanistan and Iraq altogether, added together. Uh, and all that within a matter of just a few weeks uh, I think I think that uh, people are beginning to wake up and and see and ask the question, uh, because the narrative says that Israel was attacked. This was an unprovoked attack by by a totally evil force on on October seven, as if nothing happened before and nothing happened after. Yeah. Uh, you concentrate on what happened 
to the civilians. Never mind. No mention is about what's happening to the to the soldiers. About 300 Israeli soldiers were killed on October 7, and a number of uh, military uh, bases were attacked and captured uh, on that day. Uh, that is not mentioned at all, and I don't want to in any way justify uh, justify uh, those activities. But you concentrate on the civilian, the attacks on the civilians. And, and, you, and you stretch it out and you bleed it out as much as you can. And, and even though I know every single person who was killed, particularly civilians, children, women, uh, is, 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 is a tragedy. In fact, is a war crime uh, when you attack civilians uh, directly. Uh, but but, but to, to, to just concentrate on that. And after a while, you have to see what is happening on the other side. What about the children uh, over 5,000 who, who have been killed? Uh, yes. I think the other thing that's really different um, about this aggression, and is this like number six or whatever since Hamas took over, is that the whole international community is talking about Gaza. I mean, yes. I have never seen so much interest and so much solidarity in all the time I've been following this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is really, really important to note um, because it makes it harder for Israel to hide. And the other thing I wanna just mention is the whole idea of where we're getting our information. Um, someone asked how many journalists have been killed. I think it's 70 journalists have been killed um, at this point. Um, and you, you know, Israel knows where every single Palestinian is located and what they're doing. So I can't imagine that they accidentally killed 70 journalists. So clearly, um, since you know they have a history of killing journalists, this is not this is an attempt to squash the information. The thing that's very uh, powerful these days is that because there's so much social media, it's like there are citizen journalists every in every house, and uh, people are on social media. They're on all sorts of uh, platforms, really reporting from the ground. And so I think it makes it much harder to hide, and it makes the the death and destruction and trauma. Uh, much more visible. And, and that really changes the tone of the story as well. I also think, um, you know, I don't want to give the New York Times too much praise, but I do think that their reporting on this uh, mm -hmm. and NPR have been very different than they were 10 years ago or 15 years yes. ago. And, you know, they always say, and this is Janine in the occupied West Bank. I mean, they, there's a shift in the language that I find really fascinating. And um, there is, um, you know, they're telling all the, you know, stories uh, that humanize the Israelis victims and injured, which is absolutely fine. But they're now doing that some um, about Palestinians as well. And in the past, Palestinians were, you know, the invisible numbers, which is where we are not numbers uh, came from. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in addition to that, I'm just thinking specifically about when there's reporting on um, the hostages taken um, by Hamas. There's also been reporting, certainly NPR, even to an extent MSNBC, CNN, about um, the prisoners, the number of prisoners in the West Bank, the number of children, um, the, the fact that um, that prisoners are held in detention um, without, um, you know, trial and, and so on, and 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 we know this. So there is, you know, some of that information that's getting out more than it used to. And also, Israel has arrested more people in the last seven weeks than they've given up. Yes. So they're actually filling their prisons even while they're releasing uh, prisoners. So yeah. I think that that's kind of leaking into the public consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Um, there was an article in the New York Times today, actually, about um, um, prisoners being released in the West Bank um, and, and certainly being treated as heroes. But but what was really striking and the, the focus of the article was about how Hamas is being viewed in the West Bank in, in heroic terms, in part because they seem to have, uh, you know, managed to get some of these people released. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you um, your sense of, of, of that and, and where this all might be leading. 
Well, you know, I think that any time that Hamas successfully hurts Israel and challenges their total domination of everything, Palestinians yes. are going to support them. Yes. Um, and I think we also have to put this in a context that the Palestinian Authority has, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority has been a collaborator with Israel for decades and has not done well by the population. So the Palestinian Authority is very, very unpopular. And I think uh, uh, Hamas gets more popular when they cause harm to Israel. Uh, I, I want to add to that, that the issue of the prisoners is, is very, very important to all Palestinians. Uh, I believe the figure is around 1 million Palestinians have been imprisoned at one time or another. That means every Palestinian family has had either a, a, a direct member or somebody very, very close to them been in prison. And those who are in prison are clearly there uh, for political crimes, even if they are involved, even if they were involved in armed resistance, and even if they were involved in terrorism, which is attacks on civilian population. So when you, uh, the, the first and most important goal of Hamas in, uh, and why it took so many hostages was in order to trade them for prisoners, in order to give hope to the prisoners and to their families. And I, I, I want to make it clear that taking civilians as hostages is itself a war crime and is illegal and should not be condoned at all. But certainly taking the soldiers uh, as to trade them for Palestinian prisoners is a goal that almost every single Palestinian uh, would applaud and, and would be uh, glad uh, to see. Uh, another, the second, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I have another little thing I was gonna add, you, you finish. No, the, the second point is that this, this idea of totally destroying Hamas is, 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 is really ridiculous. Uh, I, I'm no apologist for Hamas. And in fact, I don't like their ideology. I would not vote for them for at, at all. Uh, but, but, but Hamas is a, an important part of the Palestinian people. Uh, it's just like saying, uh, I, I don't like MAGA uh, and I don't like uh, uh, right-wing Republicans or I don't like right-wing Israelis who, who are so racist and so clearly uh, uh, fascist in, in their ideology and in their beliefs. But I don't want to kill them all. I don't want to eradicate them. Uh, I don't want to destroy them. You cannot destroy uh, an idea by just bombing it out of existence. It, it just doesn't happen. You cannot achieve it. Right. The comment, I would, well, coming off of what you said, I mean, Hamas is, is an ideology of resistance. It's, it's not something that you can bomb. And also Hamas is not a monolithic organization. Again, I'm not an apologist for Hamas, but they have a whole social service wing. They run hospitals and orphanages. You know, they, it, it's a complicated organization that has done some horrific things. Um, but the comment I wanted to make before in the reporting situation is one thing I've noticed is that when Israeli uh, young people are captured, they're called children. But when Palestinian uh, children are captured, they're called teenagers. And it's just a little nuance that hasn't changed. So Palestinian children lose their childhood very, very quickly. And you hear that in the language of the reporters, even the liberal-minded reporters. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there was a question um, raised about um, uh, getting beyond the two-state solution, which politicians are still talking about. Um, and maybe related to that is, uh, and Jonathan, you were just saying, that it, this idea of getting rid of Hamas, um, it, it seems that more likely what we're doing is creating more energy, really, for Hamas. Um, but... Uh, can we imagine um, there will at some point be a true ceasefire? The fighting presumably will end at some point. What should we be working towards both in Gaza and then in the West Bank following this? I mean, Jonathan, you've written extensively and, and, and powerfully about an alternative. Has anything in terms of what's happened over these series of weeks altered um, uh, your sense of things? 
yes. Uh, first, I hope somebody puts in the chat box uh, my book, Beyond the Two-State uh, Solution, which people can download from the website of Nonviolence International for free in Arabic, English, Hebrew, or Spanish uh, now. Uh, I, I think that the issue is not just Gaza. Also, the issue is not only the West Bank. The Palestinian issue is much broader. And I think it is legitimate to say that you want a solution that creates freedom, equality, and dignity for everyone from the river to the sea. The uh, people, you know, say Palestine free from the river to the sea is a call to be free of Jews. No, free of Jewish supremacy, free of racism, free of apartheid, uh, providing justice to both Jews and Palestinians in all of Palestine. Somehow the two-state model has not worked, has not worked for Palestinians, has not worked for Israelis, uh, and, and has not worked for the area. Somehow we all feel connected to this land. Zionist Jews feel connected to all the land. They feel connected to Hebron, they feel connected to Jerusalem, and Palestinians feel connected to all the land. Uh, from the West Bank to Gaza to the Galilee. The question is not that there is any connection to the land. The question is, can we have a coexistence that is not built on supremacy and domination and exclusive control and power, but that is based on coexistence, on accepting others as well as yourself? on knowing that this land which is yours also is very important to somebody else. So, and, and I believe we can have that. It is possible uh, to have a solution that gives both Zionist Jews and Palestinian Arab nationalists almost everything they, they want except for exclusivity, mm -hmm. except for domination, except for supremacy except for the right to deny or dehumanize or demonize or delegitimize or disenfranchise the other. I think as long as we think in narrow national territorial categories, we'll have a problem because each side thinks the whole land belongs to them. It can belong to them as long as they accept that it belongs to somebody else as well, and both sides can live together. But if you think it belongs only to me, then you have to destroy the other. And whether, if that is the ideology of Hamas, then I reject it. If that's the ideology of Israel's ruling parties, then I reject it. We need to have a new solution, a new ideology, that encompasses and includes both sides rather than excludes the other and delegitimizes them. And part of me um, feels that given the, tr the extraordinary trauma that is happening now, that that's become even farther away, that the divisions are only deeper now. The other part of me, wants to think that given, in fact, precisely because of the uh, immense destruction and devastation, maybe this is a time when we can talk about um, another solution, as you suggested. Does that make sense? Alice, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Alice, um, you le we're leaning no, forward. No, I, I was looking at the chat, so I missed the sentence before. Does that make sense? Could you say that again? I'm sorry, I was trying to respond yeah, to something. It just, that, that, you know, on the one hand, it, it just feels like we're farther away because of the immense trauma. We're farther away from any ability to come together. But maybe it's precisely because of the extreme 
destruction and, and trauma, that mm -hmm. it is a time that uh, for a new solution. Well, you know, I honestly don't know. Um, a lot for me depends on does the ceasefire hold? Does Israel destroy the Israeli military destroy the South? Do Gazans get pushed into the Sinai? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is this physically going to look at and how much trauma is there going to be? And so I'm I'm right now kind of like so horrified. I, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um, the Israeli leadership, you know, you got to look at them very seriously. Uh, you know, the right wing is uh, powerful and saying all sorts of horrific things like we're going to bomb for the next two months. Um, Netanyahu certainly wants to stay in power because after he gets out of power, he's going to jail. So hopefully <laughs> if we have something to say about this. So um, it's really hard for me to imagine how we get from where we are right now yeah. to a better place. I do think what's happening is that international actors are talking about other solutions since this currently is really terrible, but I don't fully understand how you take two parties that are so in different camps and one that is devastated beyond devastation. And also, you know, Israelis were really devastated by the Hamas attack. They, they had lived in this fantasy mm -hmm. that they could just keep Hamas and Gaza kind of squashed. If they mowed the lawn, quote, quote, um, every couple of years, they could just keep them down. And so they had this sense of security, which was totally false, that you can oppress people and they will not rise up. So they were busy taking over the West Bank and ignoring Gaza, which is why the Hamas was able to do so much damage because the soldiers weren't even there. The military wasn't there. Um, so they're suffering from trauma, humiliation, fear. These things do not usually make people more reasonable. I mean, the thing that I find interesting is that a lot of the hostages came from lefty families. And so a lot of the families are saying, we need a ceasefire, we need to negotiate. I mean, they they sound much more reasonable than you know Ben Gavir and Smotrich and Netanyahu, who are totally unreasonable. Um, you know, the Hamas leadership, um, you know, the Palestinian leadership. You know, I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, Abu Mazen is like you know very old and very ineffective, and the PA needs tremendous something to be an effective organization. Um, you know, Hamas hasn't really done well by. Uh, in terms of being a governing body. I mean, you know, I, I just don't know how it's going to get from here to there, although I think it has to get from here to there because we have to have a political solution to a political problem. Uh, but I'd be very interested to hear what Jonathan has to say about how you make that leap uh, okay. because it just, it, it's such a mess right now. Yeah. The, the, there's no question that in the short term, it's very hard to imagine uh how, how this could happen mm -hmm. uh it, it's gonna take some time for it to even sink in uh, but but one of the cl clear lessons uh, of of this war is that there is no military solution you cannot bomb palestinians into submission with 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 with, with all your power and with all your might palestinians still managed to surprise you and shock you uh, and, 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 and your army and your secret services and your powerful mechanisms of control. And, and the Israeli population knows that managing the occupation cannot happen anymore. It doesn't work. Well, genocide also cannot happen. <laughs> it will not be allowed to work. Once you internalize that, and you say, okay, what do we do then? You have to do something. You cannot go back to the way things are were before October 7th. I think most Israelis are convinced of that. The question is, where do you go then? Where do you go right. next? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this is very difficult uh, because, as you said, uh, there, there's a trauma. Uh, they've been re-traumatized as, as the Palestinians have been traumatized. And, and maybe this is where we need a lot of healing for both communities. Maybe we can't by ourselves, Palestinians and, and, and Israelis, solve this. Maybe we need outside forces, not the United States, which is definitely a party 
and definitely complicit and yeah. definitely on one side rather than another. Yeah. But but maybe there are other actors in the international community who can step in and say, uh, th th this is too much. It has gone too far. We cannot tolerate it. We cannot accept it. Uh, th there needs to be a solution and a real solution. A solution not based on uh, a perceived balance of power, but a solution based on justice, based on long-term interests, based on coexistence, based on recognition of the rights of both the Palestinians and the Jewish Israelis. Now, and I think it is possible. And, and I think there is a tremendous hunger, a tremendous appetite for such a solution, both among Israelis who are upset with their government anyway, and with Palestinians who are also upset with their leadership as well. I mean, we need to remember that before the attack, there were massive demonstrations in Israel about the uh, judicial reform that uh, Netanyahu was putting forth. So yeah. they were all mobilized to preserve, quote, their democracy uh, for themselves. Um, and then as soon as the war started, all those reservists who said, we're not gonna serve again, marched right into their military bases. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the worry. And, and it is, it's an astonishing image. Again, you know, right after October 7th, just thinking about um, uh, those in the kibbutz. I mean, they're just literally on the other side of the Gaza fence, basically, right? I mean, it's so close. Yeah, it's so and close. there they are. Mm -hmm. um, partying i mean you know uh, having a rave having a dance kids families i mean it's so familiar to most of us on this call i'm sure right i mean we can easily imagine ourselves in that space and and suddenly that wall is broken right i mean that's what we're living with is the reality of that fact um not surprisingly uh there was a question, and I'm sure both of you get this all the time. Um, uh, if, if, if you know, leadership in Gaza is is not working, leadership in the West Bank is not working and hasn't been for a long time. So, a question that is raised by a, a listener here is, where do we turn? Who do we turn to? Are there people? That that uh, uh, both of you, either of you, see as as potential real leaders, um, you know, in the West Bank or or in Gaza, and then beyond that, you've also talked about, you know, it's not going to be the United States. Um, do you see do you see people um, somewhere in the international community um, who could help with this? Well, I think that. Okay. Hmm? Go ahead. Go ahead, Alice. There are one of the things that I've been impressed with is the leadership from younger Palestinians. Like if you look at um, the analysis with Al Shabaka, which is like a really powerful um, analytic group that looks at uh, you mm -hmm. know doesn't belong to Fatah or Hamas and does a very intelligent analysis of what's going on and how to move forward. Um, so I, I would look to um, younger Palestinians who are not sort of part of the system. Um, to, to be the leadership. And also, you know, the diaspora, there's an immense educated, involved, committed diaspora who could potentially also be part of the leadership. I mean, after the Oslo, of course, all these people went back because they thought it was going to be a time of flowering of Palestinian power and statehood and all this stuff. You know, this is a whole untapped resource that is very, very different from Fatah and Hamas. I, I don't know what you think, Jonathan. Yeah, also the political prisoners. I mean, there's so many political prisoners in jail who are the sort of Nelson Mandela's of of uh, Palestine um, that also could be part of the leadership. Yeah, uh, I, I I don't think it's just a question of leadership because the Israelis have very systematically uh, decapitated uh, Palestinian leadership. They have fragmented the Palestinian people uh elections would definitely bring in a new crop of much more reasonable much more honest much more creative uh people 
So elections would help on the Palestinian side. On the Israeli side, I think what is needed is not so much uh, the opportunity to elect a new leadership as to put some real restrictions on what that leadership has to do. So far, the Israelis have not had to deal with international law, have not had to deal with the Arab world, have not had to deal with international public opinion, have not had to deal with issues of human rights, equality, and justice, because somebody else was footing the bill and somebody else was providing the umbrella and protection so that whether it was a right-wing or a left-wing government, it didn't matter because nobody could force them to do anything. They were being enabled to not look at reality until reality slapped them in the face. So I think if exposed to reality, both Israelis and Palestinians will realize that violence is not the answer that the domination of the other side is not a possibility. And once you, once you learn that and accept that, th that I need some solution that also makes sense to the other side rather than a solution that I can impose on the other side, I think there are many, many creative possibilities that, that, that can come into being. But I think that that will only happen if there are consequences to Israeli behavior. Precisely. If the U.S. keeps sending them billions of dollars of military aid, yes. no matter what comes out of our leadership's mouths, mm -hmm. as long as they get that money, they're going to keep it. It's, it there's no punishment. And mm -hmm. there's also this massive you know, military industrial surveillance system that is no one talks about that is very critical that keeps the system going and that you know Gaza is where all the new weapons are field tested horrific word uh, you know we have to yeah. there has to be a consequence for israel and the question is how how can we make that happen and that's our job as american citizens to make that happen we also have and i think you alluded to this earlier um, Alice, that uh, the government in Israel, I mean, is increasingly right wing. Um, and um, so there's that trouble. Um, somebody asks, um, and, and this maybe ties into to what you were just talking about, um, especially in the United States, um, you know, what two things should we be doing? Can we be doing right um, to uh, try to uh, awaken our own legislators? Well, I think calling them every day uh, is a start. <laughs> Protesting in the streets is a start. Sure. Not electing them is a start. Um, changing the conversation within your community is a start. I mean, it has to happen on all levels. Yeah. And so as individuals, you know, make a commitment to talk to 10 people who disagree with you and see if you can move them a little bit. <laughs> Call your elected people, no matter how headbanging that feels, every day. Give them the statistics every day. Talk about why you cannot accept this. Um, you know, I, I, it's political organizing. That's how you do it. And then get out on the street, sign the petitions. I mean, it's basic political organizing. I, I totally agree. And, and I will also add that that works. It does work, but it takes a lot of effort. And sometimes giving a message that is not acceptable to those who are in power, you have to use uh, what's called a prophetic uh, message with some direct action. Sometimes you even have to take a risk. Sometimes you have to do civil disobedience. Sometimes maybe you have to refuse to pay your taxes. Sometimes maybe you have to uh, sit in or have a die in at your representative's offices. Maybe you have to go to their homes, to their churches where they worship, uh, challenge them directly because what is happening is so horrendous, so horrendous. This is not just a, a dispute over a particular small policy issue where, where you, know, you can be either right-wing or left-wing or liberal or conservative. This is genocide taking place with, 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 with the governments 
direct responsibility and complicity being done in our name and with our money and, 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 and to say, no, this is wrong. I want to remind people of how international law developed after World War II. After World War II, there was a huge popular response by ordinary people who say this is too much. This level of destruction is unacceptable. We have to make war itself illegal. We have to establish new norms for international law. We have to make it clear that you cannot take somebody else's land by force, no matter what the justification, that there are certain weapons that are too horrendous to be used and should be made illegal, that there are conventions about collective punishment, about torture, about the rights of women, about the rights of children. All these things did not happen because the governments suddenly decided to do them. This was popular demand that forced these things on the governments and the governments had to fall in. They tried to find themselves little excuses like the veto power of the Security Council uh, and, and, and to establish ways to get around uh, some of these things. But it was ordinary people who, who felt the horror of World War II who demanded that these laws, including by the way, a convention for the prevention and punishment of genocide, yes. which now fits, we must bring it into use now these days, including the creation of an international criminal court at The Hague. Yeah. Uh, so ordinary people can and should make their voices heard. The horror of what we heard, the the the, the information that Alice was sharing with us at the beginning, instead of paralyzing us with its horror, should invigorate us and activate us and get us moving on these issues. And I think we can have an impact. Mm -hmm. We can say to the US, it is enough. You cannot just continue to pretend. You cannot have a double standard. You cannot have anybody support you on the Ukraine when you're doing this in Palestine uh, and Gaza. Uh, you cannot demand a, an order-based uh, international system. There is international law already there. Start strengthening it, start applying it, start joining it instead of undermining it. And this is what only ordinary people can do and their churches and their civil society uh, and, and they're people of conscience. And I think if you're looking for um, a group that's organizing actions, Jewish Voice for Peace is doing an incredible job mm. all over the country. Absolutely. I mean, in Seattle, we closed down the federal building for two hours. We closed down the Space Needle. I mean, these things uh, attract public attention and they're really doing a good job. So their website is a good place to go. Yeah. You know, I would also say with the International Criminal Court, they've been very uh, slow to really hold Israel accountable. So, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know how they work, but I think that they um, also need uh, to be pushed to uh, follow through on what their mandate is. I, I don't know what your take is on them, but they seem not to move with enough uh, power and efficiency. Yeah. Well, I'm actually writing an article about that. Uh, for the Washington, uh, uh, the Arab Center of Washington uh, about the use of the genocide uh, convention. Mm -hmm. uh, the International Criminal Court has a problem in that the person who was uh, uh, elected, I guess, as the prosecutor has been deliberately dragging his feet when it comes to Israel. Although he was very quick to work on the Ukraine and even issued arrest warrants for Putin. Uh, so uh, I think the ICC can and should act as well. But they can only do that if they are challenged and forced to do their job. Yeah. If they are left yeah. on their own, they will listen to the powerful, to the elites, to those who have uh, authority in this world and not listen to the law itself and the people of conscience.
Yeah. And that's true of legislators as well, right? They need that's to it. be encouraged often to, to speak what they actually feel. That's the problem, right? But they need the backing of their constituents. And let me add, this is a, a, a call sponsored by FASNA and by um, the uh, Episcopal Diocese of, of uh, Olympia. So again, the, the churches can and should be a, a place of power around this as they were in ways in South Africa. Um, so there, there are opportunities um, to work through the churches which do have a voice um, an important voice in this. So uh, that would be my hope. Maybe, yeah, Jonathan. Maybe this is the time uh, to, to raise the issue, uh, which is the elephant in the room, which is how the expression anti Semitism, anti Jewishness, mm -hmm. is being weaponized yes. to silence the voices of conscience, to yes. silence discussion of. Israel, Palestine, to silence those who want to bring about a just solution. I thank God every day for groups like JVP and mm -hmm. If Not Now and others in the Jewish community who have taken the lead, truly, uh, to, to fight for Palestinian rights. And in so doing, I think, are doing more than anybody else yeah. to fight anti-Jewish bigotry. Because if it wasn't for these people, everybody would be tempted to buy into the toxic, evil ideology of anti-Jewishness and, and of blaming the Jews for everything, which is wrong and which should be fought. We should fight against anti-Jewishness and fight against anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian discrimination and all forms of racism and discrimination. We cannot allow the legitimate fight against anti-Jewishness to be used to justify Jewish supremacy and the crimes of the State of Israel and its Zionist movement. Yeah. So I want to Alice. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank everybody. I actually have another webinar in That's four right. minutes. Uh, so um, <laughs> it's a busy, busy seven weeks, let's say. Um, yeah. I will post my email one more time. Um, but I thank everybody for your interest and this powerful discussion. But unfortunately, I have to get ready for the next yeah. event. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Appreciate it. My email in here. Yeah, yeah. People want slides. I, I just want to know who you are and what you're doing with the slides if you want my slides. Got it. But this is also recorded. So it's all recorded. That's right. Okay, yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alice. And just underscoring um, the, the role of JVP, the, the one national JVP conference I was at in Chicago, I was amazed at just the energy of so many young people, right? Um, and and I, yeah, it was it was quite extraordinary to to, to feel that. Um, um, any yeah, bye bye, Alice. Thank you again. Um, and Jonathan, any final words? We have three minutes. Yes, I, I want to end up on a, on on a slightly positive uh, uh, tone, you know. And and uh, in addition to thanking uh, everybody who's put this thing together and anybody who has uh, participated and anybody who will get the recording because they're registered for 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 this uh, i want to say that uh, i want to speak now as as a palestinian and as a christian and and as a pacifist who doesn't believe in violence mm -hmm. uh, many times we are tempted into thinking uh, that we need to find a solution that we need to uh, create a solution that fits everybody else. And, and, and that, that's a heavy burden to carry because anytime you propose a solution, other people will say that there are obstacles to it, there's something wrong with it and it's not good enough. Many times what we need to do is to be true to our principles, to really say, what do we really believe in? Do we believe that we can only fight terrorism by 
bombs and more bombs, that violence is the only answer? Do we believe that international law means anything? Do we believe in human rights? Do we believe in equality? Do we believe that racism and discrimination are wrong? Do we believe that collective punishment is, 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 is horrendous because you're going against, civili against innocent people? Do we believe that attacking civilians is wrong? That attacking hospitals is wrong? Even if somebody is hiding in that hospital, then, then you really shouldn't bomb that hospital. You yeah. must find different ways of dealing with it. Even if you believe Hamas is, is an awful organization, you must find another way to engage with them rather than demonize them and, 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 find, and, and try to destroy them and, and in much of the country while you're at it. Uh, so at some level, we are responsible for ourselves. We are responsible for our own actions. And, and we're not responsible for the final outcome because, you know, as a Christian, I believe God is sovereign and ultimately responsible. Our duty is to be faithful, to be true witnesses, to do the right thing as much as possible, and certainly not to harm other people while we're doing it. Uh, and, and I think it's possible. I think the horror of what is happening today in Gaza should have a lesson for everybody. Yes. Violence doesn't work, yeah. does not solve problems, yeah. does not create security, does not bring liberation yeah. and freedom to Palestinians or security and safety to Israelis. Exactly. We must find other ways of dealing with these issues. Yeah. And I think we can, and I think we should. And certainly, I think we have an obligation to move in that path rather than each of us try to be the late Kissinger and solve the whole problem. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm sure I'm not alone in, in reflecting back on the experience that most of us went through at 9-11. Uh, um, and that sense that we actually had an opportunity to respond in a different way um, that we failed to take, of course. And here we are again, really, with a chance to respond in a different way, potentially. And uh, so we just need to keep doing that work and raising our own voices. So um, my thanks to Jonathan, to, to Alice, um, to Fosna, um, um, and thanks, shout out to the Bishops Committee, um, and um, we're heading into Advent. Those of you who are um, liturgical Christians uh, will be aware of that. And so this Advent could be a time for doing some important work uh, and moving more deeply into that space that Christ calls us to. Thank you. Um, God bless. And uh, see you all again.